I'm actually going to do two small cases in one for you guys today. They're both kind of from, is it Victorian times, late 1800s into 1900s? Is that the Victorian times? I should have looked that up. But yeah, so uh, just a warning, one of them involves the death of children. That will be the second one. So if you just want to watch the first one then and you want to skip that one, then that's fine. But uh, otherwise you can watch the two of them. So the first one we're going to start with is, it's a smelly one, guys. So on April 16th, 1903, a story takes place in Clones in Monaghan. I always struggle, is it like clones or clones? Clone, clones. And 25-year-old John Flanagan has come to Clonus to go to the like local market. So he basically is an egg trader. There's a career for you. So he would go to like Clonus market and buy the eggs for like whatever price. And then he was able to go across the border into Belfast and sell them to stores for like a really high price. This is how he made his kitchen. So after a couple of hours at around half 10, 11, he decided it basically says that he decides then to go around and pay his debts, which would obviously be to the people who he has now bought the eggs from. However, he goes to Joseph Fee. He is a 21-year-old like butcher. So basically his like his home is a slaughterhouse. He lives with his, his family and like him and his dad are butchers. And when he arrives, he then says like, oh, I'm busy. Can you come back at half 11? He did arrive back. And Fee wasn't there. So then it around for like an hour. No one showed. So annoyed, he went back to the market and kind of continued doing whatever he was doing and getting ready to kind of finish up. Then all of a sudden, Fee shows up at the market and is like insisting that he goes back with him because he has something for him. So he heads off. He had two helpers with him. So he had Patrick Moan and Joseph Connolly. And so he says to them like, okay, I'll be back in 10 minutes. But 10 minutes pass and he hasn't come back. Half an hour passes and he still hasn't come back. So they start going around looking for him and they can't find him. They don't find him at Fee's place. They don't find him anywhere else. At this point, the farmers who have sold the eggs, they're annoyed. Like, they're like, where's my money? You know, because he had the money on him. He had travelled with £80 to the market. So they're all queuing up being like, where's my money? Where's my money? So the two lads, the two helpers, had to actually ring back dad and sister. And they had to travel to Clonus to pay off the debts. And then obviously they started looking around for their son and brother. He was finding a drink. So they checked the local pubs. They hadn't seen him. Fee actually then starts helping. He basically says like, oh, he did see him and he paid He paid him his two pound debt. And then he went off and he tries to say that he went off with a woman and things like this. But nothing came from it. There was, they didn't find him. And so eventually they all had to head off. Fast forward to the 15th of December. So as I said, Fee's place was a slaughterhouse. So obviously his neighbours already went happy of the smell. However, he had started to allow like manure, dung, to build up in the yard. And the neighbours obviously weren't, weren't happy with the smell. It was horrific. And they complained to the council who told him he had to clear it. So Fee employed Albert McCoy and John Farmer to clear the dung. So basically they would like scoop loads of it up onto a cart and head off out to out of town, get rid of it, come back, keep doing that. And so eventually farmer's pitchfork hits like something hard and it turns out to be a boot so under several feet of manure and then under two feet of soil they came across the body of a man they obviously immediately went to the police to tell them and the police suspected they knew who it was head constable McKeown immediately went to confront fee and when he arrived it said that fee's eyes were like watering he kissed his sister goodbye and tried to like flee, but obviously they caught him and arrested him. The body was actually covered with like lime, you know, like to kind of speed up the decomposition. But the soil that he had buried him in was quite peaty, it says. So this obviously must help to maintain the body. So the body is obviously taken up as it is a pig sticker knife falls from the body. The body is then brought to the public house, the pub, for the post-mortem. The cause of death was found to be like a violent blow to the head and it, it punctured into the brain. There was also a vertical slice down the throat, which sliced through his Adam's apple. Fee was arrested and charged with the murder of John Flanagan. And in March 1904, he was tried in Monaghan. 
and the jury couldn't decide. In July, they had another trial in Monaghan and the jury could not decide. So in December, they held it in Belfast and there was actually a huge crowd outside the trial. Um, so basically for that court, they would only let people in if they actually had business in the court. So a huge crowd just gathered out outside. It doesn't kind of say like that they were shouting or yelling or taunting or anything. It just has a big crowd. So I'd say more so for like the the interest, the intrigue from it. The trial lasted three days and the defence basically put forward to try say that like it could have been Fee. Fee was seen at the market at that time and like a couple of witnesses came forward to say that but it turned out like that they were drunk and stuff like this so there wasn't really a lot of weight in this. The prosecution basically had evidence. Now one of the sources says that they have evidence that he had bought the weapon in a hurry and another source says that it was a spade because basically an ironmonger, James Nicholl, said that on the day that um, Flanagan went missing, Fee went in there in a hurry to buy a spade. So obviously there was the like pig sticker knife, which they assume was from, you know, for cutting the throat. And then um, they assume it was like a hatchet or something that he already had that pierced his head. Aside from this, he like just kind of shortly after he uh, Flanagan went missing, he built a wall to close in the manure and like that he started to allow the manure to build up. He also was able to go off and pay all his debts off and started buying better quality animals. He was also found to have John Flanagan's wallet because it said JF on it. So Joseph Fee, John Flanagan, with less than an hour deliberation, he was found guilty. He was hanged two days before Christmas in Armagh prison. Witnesses, it, one of the sources says that like witnesses say that they didn't see him struggle or anything, but that a doctor would say afterwards that he was strangled. Remember, I just talked about in one of the other videos that like it was too short and too long and all this. And basically saying that he strangled like he would have been choking for 20 minutes. But his executioner was Tom Pierrepoint, who like in Ireland alone had done over 20 executions. And then obviously in the UK, he'd done even more. So I don't know if he would have messed up with something like that. And speaking of Pierrepoint, Pierre, Pierre Point, Pierre Point. I feel like it's Pierre Point, but I sound like a dope saying that. So he basically says that he had reservations as to his guilt because right up until the last moment, he essentially was like just kept insisting he was innocent. I mean, he wouldn't be the first person to do that. And just as he was about to pull the lever, he, it's reported he then shouted, "Executioner, guilty." So I don't know if that means like he's admitting he was guilty or if he's calling the ex executioner guilty for killing an innocent man what do you think i'm just gonna read um the quote that john fee is supposed to have said when he uh, like they asked could he give any reason why he shouldn't be sentenced to death and he said well my lord the evidence that has been put forward against me by the crown is all lies perjury i swear now i am innocent I am not afraid to meet my death. So long as I am innocent, I do not care. It is said then that the judge had tears in his eyes as he sentenced him to death. And he says, Joseph Fee, two juries of the county Monaghan, the, count, the county in which this crime was committed, were either unwilling or unable to come to a conclusion. A jury of the citizens of Belfast, apart from the county in which you were known and carried on your trade and in which this crime was committed, were irresistibly impelled by the overwhelming nature of the evidence against you to the one and only conclusion they could come to, that yours was the hand that on the 16th of April 1903 struck down John Flanagan. No honest jury or juror who was determined to do his duty could have come to any other conclusion. On the 19th of December 1899, at around 2pm, John Dunphy was on Bearsford Street in Waterford, clutching his stomach in agony. The boy collapsed. A stranger tried to hold him and comfort him as his body was rigid. His mouth foamed and he called out for his dad. The car was flagged down and the boy was brought to Waterford County Infirmary. Dr Kelleher immediately suspected strychnine poisoning. The boy would go on to have several more fits. His body continued to be rigid. Fist and jaw clenched, his head thrown back, and eventually he would die. 
He was in agony and he remained conscious throughout. A nurse there recognised the little boy as Patrick Dunphy's son, who was a 74-year-old labourer. Poor Patrick Dunphy arrived shortly after. Poor Patrick Dunphy lost his wife the previous year and just months before lost his nine-year-old son, Edward. He died on the 29th of September in a very similar way to John. And his inquest said that he died from severe epileptic fits that caused a heart attack. When police found that both sons were insured, they became suspicious. Patrick had collected £10 after his son Edward died and was due to collect another £10 for John. John's organs were removed and sent to the Royal College of Surgeons in Dublin. And it was confirmed that he had died by strychnine poisoning. A week later, they would exhume Edward's body and have it tested. And again, this would confirm strychnine poisoning. Patrick Dunphy was charged with the murder of his two sons. The trial went to court on the 9th of March and Patrick pled not guilty. It will be said that he had been out of work and so had like another brother. I'm assuming the eldest brother. So they were both out of work. They were able to prove that he had bought strychnine from two separate pharmacies in the city. He would claim again that it was for rats. His 13-year-old daughter Mary took the stand and she said that they had never had a problem with rats. That her father had never said anything about them having a problem with rats. She said that like that they didn't have any money. That She said like that that her father and brother had been out of work for two weeks when her younger brother John had died. She had asked her dad for money to like run the house, which is just wild that like a 13 year old is, in respons- is responsible for that, but that's how it was. And that he told her he had no money. On the day that John died, Mary said that Patrick told him he was going to bring him to buy new clothes and that John was in like this great humour as they left. Patrick Dumpy then obviously arrived later screaming and roaring that John had died. Dr. Kelleher would tell the trial of the graphic details of how John died. He said that he asked Patrick Dunphy, you know, did his son suffer from fits? And he said once. He also then mentioned that his mother had died, you know, the same way from fits. But Dr. Jackman would testify that his wife died from cancer, not from fits. Professor Lepper from the Royal College of Surgeons basically said that they detected two to three grains of strychnine in John and one or two to Edward, and that just one third of a grain up to 1.5 is a fatal dose. Mary Cooney from the public house on Parade Quay would say that on that day that John died, Patrick Dunphy came in and ordered a glass of beer and a bottle of lemonade. That he then kind of went over to the door where his son was and gave him, the, gave him a glass with the lemonade in it and said, finish the lemonade, boy. She said his back was to her at this point, so she doesn't know, obviously, if he had done something. And that he, like, lifted the glass up to the boy's mouth to make sure that he finished it all. District Inspector Smith would testify that in a statement, Patrick Dunphy said that his, the, you know, that Edward had died from a fit, his mother had died from a fit, and that her father had died from fits. The defence basically argued that they were, you know, accidentally taken. Patrick Dunphy did not testify. It took the jury just four minutes of deliberation to find Patrick Dunphy guilty of his son's murders. The judge also like scolded or scathed or whatever the word is, the insurance companies who were actually, you know, insuring children's lives. And he sentenced Patrick to death by hanging. The last execution before this had been 36 years before. So a new gallows had to be erected for his hanging. And because of his age, a lot of people thought he would actually just get, you know, it commuted to life. But he was not shown any mercy. He was hanged on the 10th of April, 1900. He never confessed and he never showed any remorse. And I shall see you all in the next video. Thanks. Bye.